There he goes again. That's him. That's on the roof. Welcome to Dean at Stumps, the cricket encyclopedia. The Sri Lankans are stunned. The Zimbabweans are jubilant. Look what that means to them. The first ever series victory against Sri Lanka. Hello and welcome to the Dean at Stumps Extra podcast. And uh, when we have the extra, the Dean at Stumps Extra, you will know that uh, it is something very special. And that's exactly what it is. Because the person that you're going to be hearing from now scored 4,796 runs in Test Match Cricket for Zimbabwe in 63 Test appearances with a career best of 232 not out against India. Uh, he uh, scored 6,786 one-day international runs at an average of just over 35 in 213 one-day internationals for Zimbabwe, which included 55 50s and 400s with a best of 145 against India as well. And of course, uh, at one stage was ranked as the world's number one test batsman. He played for Zimbabwe from 1992 up until 2003. And, uh, of course, went on to coach England very successfully. Yes, I am, of course, referring to Andrew Flowers, Zimbabwe's finest test batsman that has been produced and quite possibly may even ever be produced. Although one certainly hopes that that particular uh, situation may change in years to come. Will that change? Well, I guess time will tell. Well, nevertheless, as we know, Andy Flower has been out of Zimbabwe and uh, well settled in England now, so he certainly has a lot to do and has a lot of knowledge about what's happening in England and the up-and-coming cricketers as well as the current crop of cricketers. And uh, he started off by, first of all, talking about the current England team and as to why they are so successful. Look, England have an incredibly strong squad. There's evidence for that in the fact that they're number one, the number one one day international side in the world at the moment. And they go into this tournament very confident. Uh, the, I suppose the only two controversial um, or uncertain aspects to the squad are uh, who Jofra Archer is going to replace. I mean, the discussion over whether he's going to be in the squad or not, I think, is over from the way he's performed, uh, not only in franchise cricket, but in his two short chances, two or three short chances he's had with England. So so who does he replace? And whether or not the, the England selectors and head coach stick with Joe Denley in the squad or perhaps uh, replace him with Liam Dawson, the left arm spinning all around her who has had a wonderful Royal London one day series cup for um, for Hampshire. So I think those are the two question marks. Uh, regardless of which way they go on those two uh, issues, uh, England have an excellent squad and I don't think they've ever gone into a World Cup 50 over tournament as confident as they do now. What do you think has made England or, you know, the, their way or their brand of, of playing has changed over the years? So they've always been a relatively conservative one day team, haven't they? Where they've rather cautiously gone about building their innings and then, you know, waited to to finish the innings right at the end. Whereas now we see them play a very attacking brand of cricket, regardless of how many wickets they've lost and regardless of how many overs have been bowled. They're very aggressive and very attacking. Do you think that's that was a gradual change, Andy, or you know, is that something that kind of happened overnight? Uh, not quite. I think there are some very, there's some very clear moments in in their one day international history that stand out for me. Firstly, it's not the first time England have tried to be attacking. Ian Botham uh, opened the batting for England um, back in his day in the '92 World Cup, especially, didn't he? He did. Yeah. Uh, it was just when he was coming to an end on the international stage, um, but helped them get into the final. Uh, and then post that, England had used guys like Ali Brown up top. And then when I was coaching, we used uh, attacking players like Kevin Peterson up front, Matthew Pryor opening the batting, Keyes Wedder yes. uh, opening yeah. the batting for us, a very attacking, strong, uh, strong, powerful player. So it's not the first time that this, uh, this attacking method has been used by England. However, I, I do think they've ramped it up significantly uh, under Owen Morgan 
uh, and and like with most things um, that need or want change, the urgency was generated. Uh, through a bad, really bad team performance at the 2015 World Cup in Australia and New Zealand, when England were bundled out um, in the in the early rounds, I think with a really bad loss to finish the tournament against Bangladesh. I think it was in Adelaide. Yes. And I think, and uh, Owen Morgan captain that side. I think the England selectors let Alistair Cook go shortly before that tournament started. And I think the depth with which Owen Morgan felt that failure and the, the, uh, the obvious strength of his feelings, uh, given the reaction back in England to their failure in the World Cup, I think brought some real urgency to bring about change. And he, along with Andrew Strauss, uh, formulated a strategy to place one day cricket higher on the agenda and as a higher priority in Engl- in the England uh, cricket list of priorities. And the, the greatest example of action resulting from that sort of priority list would have been employing Trevor Bayliss. Trevor Bayliss had some really good success in franchise cricket and, and internationally with Sri Lanka. Um, but his bent and his speciality, I guess, mm. um, and his uh, real experience comes from, comes in white ball cricket. Uh, he'd had success at the IPL, um, and uh, Andrew Strauss brought him in specifically uh, targeting this World Cup. So Owen Morgan and Trevor Bayliss have put their heads together and... Uh, they, they formulated quite a clear strategy, um, picking certain types of players, for instance, uh, spin bowlers, uh, leg spinners that could turn the ball both ways, uh, a skill development around being able to either turn the ball uh, against a left hander, away from a left hand or away from a right hander, uh, and in- introducing seamers that could bowl slower balls that could cut the ball either away from a right hand or left hand. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and a much more attacking philosophy was the bat. Um, they've also picked a lot of all-rounders. So in some, some of their sides, you have guys like Liam Plunkett batting at number 11. And Liam Plunkett could bat at number 8 in other sides. So I think, you know, um, this emphasis on white ball cricket has done English white ball cricket the world of good. And that's why we're in this very powerful uh, position. It's, it's wonderful to hear your insights and, and to hear your thoughts. And I'd like to now shift the uh, converse, conversation a bit to you now. You have had an incredible amount of success, be it as a player and, and certainly as a coach as well. What, uh, try and, and, and compare, if you may, the differences of having success uh, or moderate success uh, with 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 when you played Test cricket, I guess a team which had moderate moderate success to then coaching a team which had a great deal of success while you were at the helm of coaching. What would the differences be? Well, uh, that, that was an inter- interesting cr- contrast for me to experience. Obviously, we didn't win that many games um, uh, when we played for Zimbabwe. Uh, But certainly, I think the principles of maximizing your potential uh, as an individual and as a team still hold true, whether you're in a a very powerfully resourced uh, sporting nation or a lesser one like Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe's only got 12 million people. Uh, uh, Most of them would not have cricket in their blood. Uh, Whereas in England and some of these other uh, big cricketing nations, the resources are uh, pretty substantial. So I think those the, the principles um, still hold true, the principles of success or trying to get the most out of yourself. Uh, uh, and it was a real privilege to, to move from a small cricketing country uh, and then coach England. You know, coaching England is one of the most sought after and important posts in world cricket uh, and 
um, and it was a it was a real pleasure and a privilege to be involved with him. I think the some of the challenges of understanding the England system, and and uh, when I say the England system, I'm talking about county cricket. Yes, I'm talking about the relationship with the counties. Uh, the the uh, quite crucially your relationship with the media, uh, which can be pretty tricky, um, and obviously like in any job, um, managing up as well as down and sideways. So, uh, as as the head coach or technical director, I think I was called, or team director, I was called at that time. You know, there's quite a lot of facets to the job, which make it fascinating. Uh, and really challenging and uh, particularly rewarding. Was it difficult at times to coach a team with a lot of very big names uh, and, and to try and get them to play together as a team? Because as an outsider looking in, we always got the feeling that you know England were a very tight unit. But then, I, and I mean, the successes that you had, Andy, as coach and, and as a team as well, uh, the home and away Ashes series wins in 2009 home, 2010 away from home in Australia. The, the, the series win over India in 2012 gave us the impression that England were an incredibly tight unit as a team. But then, dare I say, after maybe the, the England's um, home series to South Africa, it then started to appear that that possibly may not be the case. And I mean, obviously, I'm referring to what happened with, with Kevin Peterson and, and everything else that, that happened after that. So, you know, um, was it difficult to, to manage a team with a couple of very strong egos as well? I think in any, in any team, whether it's in a sport or a team uh, in an office or, or a team working down a mine, there are always going to be different characters and different egos involved. And it's always tricky managing people or, you know, relationships are tricky. You just look at your relationship uh, with those closest around you if you are lucky enough to have a family and you are relationships are, are pretty tricky, uh, whether you're in elite sport teams or other areas. So in, in short, yes, it is. It, it was tricky. Um, and I suppose there are some differences with Zimbabwe because you, you are talking about sportsmen who at, um, are growing their brands in quite a different environment. And in addition to the normal uh, challenges of managing groups. We had the IPL, which was beginning, and franchise cricket, which was starting to draw the attention of our players, uh, obviously to pretty green pastures. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it wasn't just Kevin that, that made it tricky to lead that group. You know, uh, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. So, uh, I, I, I actually found that challenge of bringing people together uh, fascinating. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the things we had to do was sort of get behind a common goal, and one of our common goals was to become the number one test side in the world. And to a large, to a large extent, we did come together really well to succeed in... Uh, in reaching that summit, uh, but I but I would admit that I don't think we ever really cracked what I would call a very close knit unit, a close knit team. And the result of that, if you don't really get that full buy in, and that's one of the skills of great leaders, I suppose. And we, and I'd say we didn't quite get. Um, if you don't get that buy-in, you might see those cracks open up when you don't win or when you have a little sustained period of not winning. And we saw that during the, um, first, the first cracks opening up during that South African series that you've just referred to, uh, but then more particularly during the Ashes in 2013-14 when we were trounced 5-0. Yes. And that's when you really see uh, see what what a team is 
all about on the team spirit front. I mean, I, I can't remember who said it, but I remember a phrase uh, that some famous sportsman used around team spirit, saying that team spirit is something glimpsed only in victory. And well, I think that's entertaining and contains a lot of truth. I think you see true team spirit during those tough times. And unfortunately, our lack of real unity was exposed, uh, which meant that a group um, splintered at the end of 2013-14. Uh, as a player uh, in a team where, uh, or a team which experienced a lot of tough times, do you feel that the team spirit, you know, was there a genuine te team spirit in the Zimbabwe team for the most of the times? I mean, naturally, there would have been times where there would have been a few, um, you know, uh, people at loggerheads. That's natural. But generally speaking, what was a team spirit like when you were a test player for Zimbabwe? Well, I think I, w I was probably one of the trickiest guys to, ma <laughs> to manage. Probably not early on when I first started um, as a youngster. And I used to sit in raptures listening to guys like John Tricos and Malcolm Jarvis, Dave Houghton, uh, Andy Pycroft, uh, Bundu Walla, etc. talk about the game. And we had incredible fun together, made some really lasting uh, friendships from that group of older cricketers. Yeah. But then, um, uh, you know, things evolve and money started coming into the game in Zimbabwe. Initially, when I first started playing, we didn't get paid anything to play. Um, and those guys I mentioned were all professionals in other areas of the economy. Um, and I was, myself, my brother Alistair Campbell, David Houghton were all employed as coaches. And that status quo existed for about, I don't know, three, four, five years as we, as we started to make our way in the, on the international scene. So I would say our spirit initially, uh, when we were first given test status around 92, uh, was generated through trying to do our country proud. And that was a really nice way to play. Uh, there were some skeptics around the world that didn't think that we should be playing international cricket. And our main driver at that time was to prove those people wrong. Uh, so uh, that, that was a really nice a drive for most of our squad and really brought us together. But I would echo what I said earlier. There were always challenges. Um, and there are always challenges in running any team in during any era. Um, and, and Andy, some of the some of the highlights as we obviously wrap this innings up and this interview up, some of the highlights that you would have had as a team and as an individual playing for Zimbabwe. What would you say some of those would would be? The highlight that really stands out for me is our first ever Test win in '95 yeah. um, in Harare against Pakistan. That was so important in my mind because we had been we'd been given test status in 92 we were fighting hard for respect as i mentioned earlier uh, but we really needed to get that monkey off our back the monkey being when will they win a test match and there were some really outstanding performances in that test match um, obviously i'm very proud of the stand that grant and i put together i think we were about 45 for three on the first day uh, after winning the toss and we came together I think we put on about 260 269 to be exact there we go so um, Grant went on to get a double 100 I got 150 and we put ourselves in such a great position to put the Pakistanis under pressure and then um, we, we bowled beautifully and caught amazingly well uh, to end up taking the 20 wickets that we needed. You know, I have very fond memories of the feeling that we had out there in the middle when we were hunting those 20 wickets. Even guys like Alistair Campbell took brilliant one-handed catches. Um, uh, it's, I've got some really special memories of the evening test match when, uh, when we celebrated what was a momentous time for us. Beating England in 96 in the one-day series 3-0 was also really memorable. Uh, we drew the test series. It was memorable for most people 
for what David Lloyd, the England coach at that time, said when we had drawn the test match in Bulawayo and he proclaimed that we murdered him, uh, which obviously they hadn't given that it was a draw. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it was uh, it was memorable because England, as I mentioned earlier, had was a, a huge cricket nation. They'd come over to Zimbabwe expecting uh, to win. They brought all their media with them, who always really enjoyed touring Zimbabwe. And we were able to put up a real show, firstly in the one days and then the test matches. Uh, and it was performances like that where we punched above our weight that made playing for Zimbabwe a really uh, special experience. The 540 runs that you scored when Zimbabwe toured India in 2000 propelled you from being just outside the top 10 in world cricket or in test cricket, you as an individual, to the world's number one ranked test cricketer. What amazed a lot of us was the way that you went about every one of those innings. 183 not out, uh, 70, 55 and 232 not out. But a lot of times Zimbabwe were on the back foot and yet you somehow managed to play as as positively as the game and the situation allowed you to do, Andy, which made it so very special. I mean, just talk to us as much as you can remember about that particular phase of your life as a test batsman, because pretty much everything that you did came off and everything you touched turned to gold. Yeah, I mean, that was a pretty uh, enjoyable tour, obviously, from a personal perspective. Uh, It was lovely spending that time out in the middle. Uh, in test match cricket. Um, I loved touring India, firstly. That was, uh, we toured India on my first away test tour. Um, I'd never played in, in, uh, in front of such large crowds or such fervent and excitable crowds. I remember initially uh, Kapil Dev really stirring them up. He was sort of just finishing as I, as I was starting. Yeah. Uh, touring India was a really special place for a young cricketer to to get to, uh, and the the feeling of excitement and interest in the in the country is really something special. I, I think the other factor that I remember very clearly about that series was playing spin, and I was I had been very lucky to be taught how to play spin by Dave Houghton. Dave Houghton himself was an excellent player of spin. Um, and I'd watched him closely and spoken at length with him about some of his theories of playing spin, and that helped me tremendously. Also, a lot of our early series were against subcontinent sides because those were the, uh, the boards or associations that invited us to play international cricket at that time. So we learned how to play spin a little, probably faster and easier than, than we did uh, learn how to play the genuine quicks on bouncy pitches. So that certainly helped in that regard. But great memories. And then, uh, of course, your hundreds against South Africa, uh, back-to-back hundreds in the same test match against a very, very good pace attack, I would imagine, would stand out quite nicely for you as well in, in 2001. That was an interesting test match, not least because when we were having a drink in the dressing room, Afterwards, after that match ended, uh, 9-11 was just happening. And we were seeing some of these pictures on our TV screen in the dressing room, um, which was uh, pretty weird. Uh, but yeah, but yes, the, the innings against South Africa in that test match uh, were really satisfying. Uh, they, they did have a good attack, and it was nice to be able to spend that sort of time in the middle against them. I remember uh, a good friend of mine, Pommy Mbangwa, who was playing in the game and batting 11, uh, came out uh, to, uh, uh, to bat with me. I think, you know, we were struggling in the game as a, as a team, but he came out and I was getting close to 200. Uh, and, um, and he just had to survive one or two balls uh, at the end of one over and he nicked off with me on 199. <laughs> And I never let let him hear the end of that. <laughs> Andy, uh, it's been wonderful talking to you. Um, it, it really has. Uh, do you ever see yourself at some point once again re-establishing ties with Zimbabwe cricket? You know, some years down the line, or do you think that that's a, a chapter that, that is behind you and it's now a closed book? 
I wouldn't say it's a closed book at all. I visited Zimbabwe a couple of years ago with my children, and it was so it was great to be back. Um, I think Zimbabwe has got a number of really difficult challenges. I would I would really dislike the uh, uh, description of closing a, a chapter or or certainly closing that book. I want to visit Zimbabwe again and. And who knows what's going to happen in the future? Uh, so, I've always, I've always really wanted to somehow. I was going to say help Zimbabwe. That sounds really condescending. I'm talking, and I don't want to sound that way. I, I, I'd, I'd like to contribute to Zimbabwe cricket in some way, but I haven't quite found the way how to do that um, uh, yet. That fits. That fits for me or Zimbabwe. Well, well, well. First of all. It was wonderful talking to Andy Flower. Secondly, the great man made a mistake because it wasn't Pommy Mbangwa who was with him when he ended unbeaten on 199. It was Dougie Hondo who, uh, of course, was making his test debut against the South Africans. Definitely not Pommy Mbangwa. Certainly Pommy was with Andy Flower when he got to a 100 against Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, that was his fourth test 100 back in 1998. But in 2001... When he was 199 not out, it was Dougie Hondo who had to bear the brunt of Andy Flowers' um, leg pulling, well, in quotes, in brackets, leg pulling. So there you are. That was Andy Flower who had a good long chat with us. Thank you very much indeed for listening to this extra podcast, the Dean at Stumps Extra Podcast. You're more than welcome to subscribe to me on YouTube as well. You simply type in Dean Duplessy and uh, there will be some fantastic interviews for you to listen with Jason Gillespie, Alan Donald, and uh, quite a few more as well. Tatenda Taibu, who talks about his book, Keeper of Faith. And we have a few more coming up. We have Gary Kirsten lined up, and then a certain Australian left-hander as well at some point. Thank you very much indeed for listening, and we'll be back again pretty soon. But until then, it's goodbye.